conversation, those who come late, it's their own problem for today. Elif, Elif Shafak is my guest tonight at Philoxenia at Kreisky Forum for International Dialogue. I am very proud and honored that you agree to do this talk with us. And so first of all, welcome Elif to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I've tried to convince you to come on a talk for years and uh, it was always complicated because you are of course one of the, the busiest public intellectuals of uh, our current contemporary world. And now that I don't have to lure you for three days to Vienna, it maybe it's easier. This is one of the perks of our new internet uh, Zoom life that uh, we can schedule more talks without even leaving our offices. And you can write books while you do the occasional talk and just sort of switch the screen probably, right? That's very tr true in the sense that maybe this is one of the few silver linings, you know, uh, lines in this uh, otherwise very challenging, very difficult year that we now do more online events and maybe the audience is more diverse now because people from very different parts of the world or within the same country from different regions can connect. And I find that very valuable. But of course, I also miss actual physical events, being in the same room, right? Sharing the same stage or the same space. And that's very precious. So I wish there was a way to do both. Well, I hope we can also invite you to Vienna in the near future when we sort of send the virus packing as um, the British prime minister used to say before he understood how difficult it would actually be to stop the pandemic. But let me go and introduce you properly because you, Elif, are one of the most thought after uh, intellectual currently uh, between London and Istanbul. You are, um, you are not only an author, you wrote 18 books, I believe, 11 of which are novels. They have been translated in 54 languages. Uh, many of them have been translated into German. And this is one of the reasons why we meet today, because your latest um, uh, book, which is actually a pamphlet, has been published in German in this very beautiful, I must say, edition at the uh, Kain and Aber, the publisher Kain and Aber. It has been translated by uh, Michaela Grabinger, and I must say in a very, very nice way also, I really like the German translation of the original English. In English, it was called How to Stay Sane in a World of Division, which I think is probably your key central topic of the last years. Since I have followed your work and started interviewing you, it was always for me astonishing to see how early on you understood that we will run into severe troubles in not being able anymore to talk to the other side, so to speak, to find uh, a way out of our echo chambers. But before we go to the book, let me continue to introduce you because I believe that while we in London are used to seeing you on practically every panel uh, of any sort of intellectual debate and also on uh, all sorts of um, juries for literary prizes, in the German speaking world, your books have been brought, but you physically by far not enough. That's why we brought you here today. And so one of the issues is that you're not only an author and a literary writer, but also a political scientist and a public intellectual speaking out on the core issues that are close to your heart and your mind, which are mostly connected uh, to equality, to uh, freedom of opinion, to rights of minorities, and all this in, in the context of your multiple identities being uh, Turkish and British, being a woman, being a sort of globalist European in a world that becomes more and more 
sort of divisive and also a lot more complicated to, um, to find um, a place where we are even in our Western open liberal democracies allowed to say what we are, want to say because it has become rather aggressive if it's now on Twitter, on Facebook, but also in, in the sort of traditional um, old uh, spaces that we inhabited before social media, because some of like in Turkey, you're, the government of Turkey makes it difficult for you to even visit them. So this is the context in which we start this uh, debate. And once again, I want to welcome you very much and thank you and thank your publisher for making this talk possible. And also, of course, Kreisky Forum, Gertrud Auer, for uh, setting up this talk series, Philoxenia, which I'm hosting for the past three years with absolute greatest pleasure. So thank you and welcome, Elif, once more. Thank you so much. It's su such a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. So let's start with your book, because um, I find it's a very small book. It's like 90 pages long. You wrote it as a plaidoyer, as a pamphlet uh, during lockdown, basically last year, watching the world uh, really become a different place. We all don't know exactly how different it will be, but it is your thoughts that I found striking. Not only I, it was reviewed by all sorts of people. Mary Beard, for example, said about it, it's a sharp and elegant um, pamphlet. I thought it was so beautiful because it's so poetic and political. And this combination is sort of one of your, of course, winning traces in all your literature and in all your talks. Um, there's one uh, place here, it's here in the German edition on page uh, 34 where you discuss the question, which is one of the key questions in this international identity debate, where do you come from? Mm -hmm. And you say here uh, that uh, you, you always want to say, I come from different, from various places. Identity is not a single causal issue. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? We cannot read uh, um, from the German now, although it's really beautiful. Uh, because I'm afraid that a lot of people won't understand German in our context tonight and you also not. So if you could talk about it a little bit, what does it mean, this question for you, when somebody says, where do you come from? Well, thank you so much. It's, it's really a question that matters to me. And it's a question that I think about a lot um, ever since my childhood, to be honest, because I grew up in different countries, although I spent most of my um, time growing up in Turkey. I also had a more nomadic life, if I may put it this way. And today when I look back, I realize, of course, I'm an Istanbulite. I'm very attached to Istanbul. And I think anyone who reads my work will see that there's a huge love for the city. And for me, Istanbul is not a passive decor, you know, a background scenery. I call it a she city. I think Istanbul has a personality of her own. And I also think it will, she will be coming with me wherever I go. So that's a very emotional bond. But equally, I feel attached to women's culture in Turkey, you know, minorities in Turkey, youth in Turkey. So of course, I'm, I'm Turkish uh, and Turkish is my mother tongue. But I also feel very attached to the Balkans. So put me next to a Bulgarian, Greek, Romanian, Bosnian, you know, author. I have so much in common with them. Equally, I have elements in my soul from the Middle East. If you put me next to a Lebanese, a Jordanian, an Iranian, an Egyptian author, this time I have a lot in common with them. But that said, I'm a European, you know, I'm European by, by birth. The values that I believe in, the values that I share, um, and over the years, I became a Londoner, I became a British citizen. I feel very attached to particularly London. Uh, and I felt free here to write as a writer. Uh, and whatever our politicians are saying in the UK, because of this Brexit saga that we're going through, I would like to call myself a citizen of the world, a citizen of humanity. Now, at the beginning of this, all these Brexit, um, 
chaos. Uh, there was a moment when Theresa May said, if you're a citizen of the world, then it means you're a citizen of nowhere. And I find that very hurtful, you know, because I don't think it's true. I think just the opposite. If you are a citizen of humanity, it shows that it's not, it's not like you're floating in the air without any care. It means that you do care about many things, many places at the same time. You can be both local and global. You can have patriotic sentiments, but also be connected to the world, to humanity. So that duality that we're being pushed into, as if you can be only one thing and you have to choose your tribe and stick to your tribe no matter what, is a duality that needs to be shattered. And I think as human beings, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you grew up in different countries or you grew up in one single town, we all have multitudes inside, like the poet Walt Whitman used to say. But the problem is in our age, we forgot to say, I contain multitudes because the politics of our time doesn't allow us to say that. And I think it's worth defending multiplicity. It's worth defending pluralism, not only in our societies, but also within ourselves. This is just, it speaks so much to me because I could never understand how um, politics can ask people to be rooted only in one place. Because as you say, even if it's two villages, it's two villages. I mean, nobody comes just from one sort of stone for one field. Yeah? But we had, for example, a few years ago in Austria, a, dis a, dis a debate about Turkish Austrians who had uh, a Turkish passport and an Austrian passport. And there was a movement to make them give up their Turkish uh, nationality. And because they were, it was said that then they had two loyalties that are contradicting each other and, and all that. And of course, also, it was before in the, the background that the Turkish uh, regime is becoming uh, more and more undemocratic. But I thought even more so, people should be allowed to keep their Heimat, which is also in our soul and in our heads, in our memories, in our smells, exactly as you describe it. Mm, it rather have uh, to be allowed to have these multiple identities because that's the reality than mm -hmm. to restrict it. And also it has turned out that all these thousands of Turkish passports that people were always talking about don't actually exist. I think it's a few hundred and, and I would welcome people always to have a second passport if you can, because it is exactly what you say, that the multitude of our identities also enriches us, doesn't, you know, shouldn't, it shouldn't restrict us. It shouldn't be sort of uh, so um, bad mouthed as something that is bad for a nation state. Mm -hmm. No, I'm with you, absolutely. And I, I wish, you know, more and more people could have more than one passport in today's world. Uh, I, I would rather live in a world that has multiple belongings, where people speak multiple languages, where people can dream in more than one language and can commute between cultures. That is a healthier world. I think what causes part of the problem is the values, the clash of values or a clash of um, sometimes identities again but it again comes back to what we're talking about because in today's extremely politicized and bitterly polarized world we are being told by hardliners on all sides and especially by nationalists on all sides that you can only be of one identity at the expense of everything else and that is not true so i think um, as long as we hold shared democratic values, as long as we defend, you know, core values like human rights, freedom of speech, women's rights, minority rights, rule of law, it is actually much better for all of us that we have multiple belongings and connect cultures rather than try to erect walls between cultures. We also need to bear in mind that we're living in a world in which we have massive global challenges ahead of us. So as we're speaking, our planet is burning. You know, we have a, we have a massive ecological crisis uh, unfolding in front of our eyes. Whether it's the possibility of another pandemic, whether it's the possibility of cyber terrorism or a financial crisis, it is very clear that we're all interconnected and there's no way we can answer global challenges with the forces of nationalism, with the forces of tribalism. 
there's no way we can solve these problems with isolationism. So I think we need to come up with a better way of thinking, especially now that we're at a crossroads with the pandemic. Oh, for sure. I mean, the question is, we had this shock wave 2016 with, uh, at the time, with the election of Trump and also uh, the Brexit referendum in the UK, which was sort of a really a change in the, in the Western uh, uh, atmosphere where people started to really think and it had one good side effect. People started to think uh, why so many people feel that they don't have a voice anymore. And that's why they voted for people or for programs that were actually not making their lives better, but they didn't know that then. And we were all discussing, so why are so many people feeling that they have lost out uh, in this whole globalization process and why they don't have a voice? Now you in your literature have always made a point since the beginning to bring these voices that nobody listens to to the forefront to the center you bring the periphery to the center you do that in in your books but you do it also in this pamphlet where you sort of talk about your childhood experience how you you listen to the silent uh, letters uh, in when mm. you when you learned how to read and write and your turkish uh, and your teacher in turkish sort of um helped you do that and you discovered the beauty of the silence and this is sort of the main theme of the book that you say like it's not only about making your voice heard it's also to listen to the other so this is why the title is also uh, heard and under too can you elaborate a little bit on this do you think this is what could heal our polarized social media world if people somehow manage to not only scream but also listen yeah, it is, it is quite challenging, isn't it? We were told years ago, especially in the early 2000s, where there was so much optimism. You will remember back then, people thought the Soviet Union is no more. Uh, people thought, you know, ultranationalism, fascism has also been defeated. And the only viable political route from now on is liberal democracy. So it is the end of history, it is the end of conflict. And back then, the biggest optimists were techno optimists, and they would tell us uh, at international conferences that thanks to digital technologies, all every inch of the world would sooner or later embrace democracy, because you can't stop the spread of information. And if you give people the right amount of information, they will, of course, make the right choices. Now, fast forward. Here we are. I think the pendulum has swung, and we have we have entered the age of pessimism. And now we know that actually being bombarded by information doesn't necessarily lead to democracy. Now we know that actually social media has a very dark side as well. And it, it unfortunately emboldens hate speech, divisions, slander, racism, sexism, you know, divisions. So it doesn't necessarily connect. But most importantly, as you said, there's a cacophony of voices um, like it feels like there's so much sound around us, and yet why is it that millions of people feel voices? Millions of, millions of people feel like they're not being heard. Um, and I find that very important. So I think as we're moving forward, if we want to move forward, we have to care about those who are feeling voiceless. We have to care about the periphery, not the center, but the margins. Who are the people who are not invited to the table when decisions are being made? Who are the people who are being left out and left behind? Where are the inequalities in our societies? The pandemic did not create the inequalities, but expose them, expose the fractures in our societies, and we need to take them seriously. So whether it's racial inequality, gender inequality, digital inequality, regional inequality, we need to deal with the inequality. And the second thing is, I think, as you said, uh, part of it is giving voice to voices, but the other part of the coin, the other side of the coin, is to be ready to listen. Because the truth is, if all my friends speak like me, if I'm surrounded by people who think exactly like me, if every day I read the same newspaper, if all my sources of information come from the same source exactly, then it means I'm living in an echo chamber. 
You know, I'm surrounded by the echoes of my own voice. We do not learn anything from echoes. Echoes are repetitive. So the truth is we learn from differences in life. And that's why cities are important. That's why diversity is important. That's why in countries like Turkey, when you lose cosmopolitan heritage, you lose a lot. You know, it's a huge slide backwards. Um, so I think it's important for us to, to promote more communication among people who might be thinking differently. And how do we unite around shared democratic principles is a question that I think about a lot. Well, it's always the same problem also. It's a good idea to promote it. How do we actually manage to do it? Like we talk to each other now, it's a public talk. People can listen, they can debate. It's, it might be also a good moment to say like, please, join us with questions. So everyone who listens to us on Facebook can type in questions and Jutta, our chief tech team manager in Vienna, will then be able to collect them and uh, read them. But if you are on the Zoom talk, you can also raise your hand, you can type questions in the chat and we can also then listen to you, um, your, your own voice if you want to and read them out yourself. So please do that, prepare them. We will talk for another 20 minutes uh, between us, but then we open the floor to all the questions. And I'm always very happy when people come forward. I know that being on Zoom and on Facebook and on the internet is a bit more uh, scary than sitting in a room together where we already can smell each other and then we can sort of discuss uh, easier. But please don't be shy and ask questions. Anyway, so back to the question, how can you engage? Do you have the feeling that, for example, in your books, when you write, that it opens uh, the minds of readers also, particularly in, in Turkey, where, where your views on gender equality and female rights, but also on transgender rights. And you know, in your last novel, which I enjoyed a lot, uh, which hasn't been published in German, I believe yet. Um, you bring sort of the setting of Istanbul with the, 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 the milieu of, of the prostitutes and transgender people together in a, in a very vulnerable space, but also in a very warm and, and beautiful friendships and, and, um, and a protection for each other in a very hostile and violent world is sort of the subject of this uh, novel. Do you have the feeling that you reach people across outside also from your usual uh, social circles? Well, one thing that um, I have noticed over the years is that I have a very diverse readership. So people who come from very different backgrounds read the same book or books. And that's something that makes me happy that means a lot to me because in a society where we are very divided into islands or ghettos, mental ghettos, cultural ghettos, I think it's important that people can share the same stories. I think it, the, the doors of literature needs to be open to, to everyone regardless. So to be honest, I have um, readers in Turkey who come from some readers who come from very conservative backgrounds and among them, there are some people who might have quite xenophobic views, particularly about minorities, if you ask their opinion in the public space. Or among them, there are some people who might have quite homophobic or transphobic views. But again, the same people come and say, you know, I've read your book, and this is the character that I connected with the most. Or sometimes they get angry at me. They say, you know, why did this character suffer? I wanted him or her to be happy. And I realized the character they're talking about is maybe gay or maybe transgender or, or maybe Armenian or Jewish or Greek or Kurdish, you know, the main minorities in Turkey. So I guess what I'm trying to say is people who might be more biased towards the other in their daily life, in the company of others, when we retreat into our inner garden, when we go into our inner space, when we are alone, and we, when we take a book and travel into that story, we become a bit more ready to connect with our other. And I don't think that's a coincidence because that is what the art of storytelling does. It rehumanizes people who have been dehumanized every day by mainstream rhetoric. 
And that's why art is about resistance, you know, as much as about it's, it's about uh, empathy and, and connections. I, I find that very important, that rehumanization of anyone and everyone who has been dehumanized by extremist ideologies. I think literature does that. Definitely. How is it with, how do you engage uh, in your political sphere with people? Uh, do you answer, for example, um, on social media, on people who attack you, or are you ignoring them? Because I find it always very difficult. You can, you know, once you start answering someone who is clearly uh, uh, furious, uh, whatever you said, and then you, the question is, does it edge people on if you answer and do you get into a whole shitstorm um, that is being picked up by other people? I mean, you have quite strong opinions for many people in your liberal views, which nowadays can lead to a complete rejection, uh, which is almost an allergy to liberal views that we can experience now also on these social media platforms especially where people are not so scared to come out because they just type something in and shoot it off and it's being retweeted and picked up and becomes an avalanche of hatred yeah. mm, do you engage in these things because that is a way maybe to reach other people but it also makes it more dangerous for your own sanity probably well, I think we all need to be very careful about social media because it, as we mentioned, it's, it's a bit like the moon. It has a bright side for sure, but it has a very dark side too. And we have seen over the years that there's too much sexism. There's a lot of misogyny. I think if you're a woman, if you happen to be a woman, you receive even more, a very different language. Um, but this is the same for women politicians, for women journalists, for women academics. Then if you are a minority, I think minorities get an additional element layer of racism or xenophobia. So there's a lot that's going on and I find it very unhealthy and it's not good for our sanity. And I don't think we should be that much engaged. Um, but I also believe that we need to become digital citizens, not only public citizens, because we can't leave the social media to extremists, to people who use the language of hate. So personally, what I try to do is, I try to share information that I find valuable. I try to promote things that I find valuable. Again, such as women's rights, such as minority rights, such as literature, arts, connections, you know, the things that I believe in that means something to me. So I'd rather use my time in a more constructive way rather than engage in that kind of polemics. Also, let us not forget, and anyone coming from countries like Turkey, Russia, or different parts of Middle East or China would know what I'm talking about. Not everything that you receive on social media means there's a person, there's an actual person. Sometimes there are bots, sometimes there are trolls. Sometimes a lot of that is automated. So it's, it's a world of illusions in many ways. How do we connect in a healthier way as human beings, fellow human beings, I think we need to make a distinction between information, knowledge, and wisdom. We live in an age in which we have way too much information, very little knowledge, and even less wisdom. So what I would like to do is to change the ratio. Let's please deal with less, less information because the truth is we cannot process this much information. But instead of that, let's deal with more knowledge. And by knowledge, I mean books. I mean investigative journalism, in-depth analysis. But most importantly, knowledge requires to slow down, to think in a more nuanced way, you know, to go within as much as without. And then ultimately, let's have much, much more wisdom. And for wisdom, we need to bring the mind and the heart together. We need emotional intelligence. We need empathy. Emotions are always belittled, underestimated. But I think that's a huge mistake. We're living in an age in which emotions guide and misguide politics. Emotions matter hugely. And it's a pity that often populist demagogues understand the power of emotions far better than their liberal counterparts. You know, I'm not belittling facts, I'm not belittling reason and logic, but all I'm saying is there's a limit to what you can achieve 
Whereas when you bring your own emotions out, it's much more human. You know, the connections are deeper. Uh, so I think ultimately for wisdom, we need stories, we need empathy, and we need emotional intelligence. Well, you also bring this example of this um, little girl in Egypt that at the beginning of the Arab Spring was called Facebook by her parents because they were probably thinking to give her a hopeful, optimistic name and they were believing in the power of social media and of Facebook to be a force of democracy, which it was at the beginning of the Arab Spring when people could organize themselves for demonstrations on social media mm -hmm. platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and you wonder in the, in the book also now what she will make of her name if she will still use it. Uh, what do you think is 10 years on in the Middle East, the Arab Spring has turned into uh, bloodlands and yeah. it has not led to free democrat democratic um, societies, partly a little bit maybe in Tunisia, but mostly uh, it's, it's a war zone. And Egypt in particular is not a war zone, but it's a very, very sort of stressful uh, situation, probably for this little girl called Facebook. Of course, uh, around the same time, there was also a family in Israel who named their third child Like. So I think about these two kids a lot, Facebook in Egypt, Like in Israel. What's their life like today? Because as we mentioned, fast forwards, we have entered the age of pessimism. It's the age of anxiety, anger, fear, disillusionment, you know, disappointment. Uh, and I think the expectations with regards to the Arab Spring, the way the Arab Spring was interpreted at the beginning was quite flawed. It's, it was quite problematic. The reference, of course, in the Arab Spring was to Prague Spring. And um, that was a little bit... Uh, unfounded because you need to understand the complexity of the region, the complexities of these societies. What is heartbreaking is to see one dictator being toppled down and then being replaced by another monopoly of power that again suppresses civil society. For me, what is crucial is to see, you know, civil societies flourish because again, coming from a country like Turkey, one thing that we have seen is that having elections in itself is not enough to sustain a democracy. Turkey has, relatively speaking, regular elections. Turkey is not a democracy. Russia has elections. Russia is not a democracy. So I'm not underestimating the power of the ballot box, but all I'm saying is, in addition to referendums, in addition to elections, you need other components to keep a democracy alive. You need rule of law, definitely separation of powers. Nobody in this world, no politician, no party, and definitely no tech company should have absolute power. It is too dangerous, power corrupts. So checks and balances, separation, so separation of powers, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, together with all these, and the free media, diverse media, together with all these components, a democracy can survive. When the components are broken in itself, a ballot box provides majoritarianism in the short run, that is not democracy, and from majoritarianism into authoritarianism, it's a very quick downfall. Uh, that's why I think we need to worry about how delicate our democracies are, not only in the Middle East or in some parts of the world, but across the world, because I think we're living in liquid times. There's no such thing as solid lands versus liquid lands, but in fact, there's liquid times and we all need to become more involved, engaged citizens and realize that democracy is a very delicate ecosystem of checks and balances. We need to keep it alive. But is for you this term, because you use it quite a lot, liquid times, liquid lands versus the sort of, you know, uh, the solid ground under our feet, which often is um, called for by more the sort of more conservative um, parts of societies. Is that a term that goes for you through the whole of society? Because I'm always thinking um, how a lot of our debates are going. And it, it seems to me that the next generation, the, 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 the millennials or the post and sets and whatever generation um, are a lot more 
you know, they see things a lot more fluid. They are a lot less stuck in this kind of separations. If it's gender or if it's political camps, people seem to be less dogmatic and less uh, authoritarian in the way they um, put things in drawers. So this term um, liquid and the term fluid for me, they sort of go together somehow in this 2021 debate a little bit, don't they? Yes, it's, and it's heartwarming to see how the, the younger generations, as you said, when they discuss gender, when they discuss the world, they actually see it in more fluid terms um, and not necessarily as dualistic as our generations. But of course, let us not forget that it's not the same thing in every part of the world. So there's still a lot of nationalism, a lot of religious fundamentalism, even in younger generations in many, many parts of the world. But I guess what I'm trying to emphasize here is, um, if I may give you an example, Many years ago, when I used to live in Istanbul, I never forget um, an American scholar who was visiting the city and working on women writers across the Middle East. She, with all good intentions, but in passing, she mentioned, she said to me that it was very understandable for me to be a feminist, because after all, I lived in Turkey and Turkey was a patriarchal land. But the way she said it, it sounded as if coming from America, she had no reason to worry about women's rights because, women, because women's rights had been achieved in America. And this is what I'm trying to challenge. Now, after Trump happened, after we've seen the rise of populist nationalisms in country after country, we have seen LGBTQ free zones in Poland. We have seen gender studies being banned in, in Hungary. We have seen the Vox movement in beautiful Spain with pictures of Hitler, you know, hiring a bus and, and using a hashtag, Feminazi, claiming that feminism destroys family values. We have seen um, conferences, you know, that Salvini supports in Italy that talk about, again, how women's movements destroys family values, etc. So all I'm trying to say is we can never take for granted our rights as women because countries can go backwards, democracies can crumble. And if this is happening, it means the first rights that will be curbed will be women's rights and minority rights. So in my opinion, women and minorities should be even more passionate advocates of democracy, because when it's gone, we have much more to lose. But you see, this is what I find so interesting in this whole debate about no platforming, because um, these values of um, respecting other people's uh, positions have been have come also under attack, not only from furious right wing politicians or governments in Poland, Hungary, or, you know, also political parties and in Spain, but it is a question also, how do you respect, for example, the, the feminist views of the generation of the around 50 year old feminists towards um, being no platform by, by the next generation of activists who are finding that uh, fighting for, for specific uh, war, uh, uh, rights for women is not necessary. We should have a universal debate because if it's universal, it is, it's also inclusive and it includes transgender and whatever rights, while if you fight for specific female rights, you're sort of exclusive of everyone who is maybe now an in-between person, a them. And I find it quite interesting to follow this debate on the academic level, but also sort of, you know, in, in, in chat forums, because there is this, and you, this pamphlet here is in a way a very careful attempt to separate all these issues and to make people understand that it is worthwhile to listen to the other. And is this your intention or am I um, just thinking that you're trying to, without calling it out, telling people to be a little bit more gentle and open your mind and, and your ears to the opinions of others if, you, it just, if they just happen not to be exactly yours? I think we all need to be better listeners, you know, regardless of which party we might be voting for, wherever, whatever our political opinions, 
or our upbringing, cultural upbringing, we all need to become better listeners and train ourselves to become better listeners. I also um, understand what, what, what you're saying, but I make a distinction. I think I'm a big believer in freedom of speech. And as a writer, I'm very much aware of the necessity for of freedom of words, freedom of expression, freedom of imagination. You know, this is our oxygen. At the same time, I'm also very much aware of the dangers of hate speech, but I'm talking about the kind of hate speech that targets individuals, minorities, people who are vulnerable and who have no power, no authority, no privilege, the kind of hate speech that incites violence against minorities is a very dangerous thing. And I think we should be very aware of that. So there are things we can challenge without losing our respect for each other. Um, if certain words, concepts, symbols that have a very heavy legacy of racism, xenophobia, sexism, or homophobia, I should be able to say this. Um, and we should be able to have a healthy debate about it. So um, I, I find it important that we listen to each other, but we also understand that power is not distributed equally in our societies. So again, it comes back to the same question. Who are the people who are left without a voice? Who are the people left without any power? And I, at least personally, would spend more of my time trying to bring the periphery to the center rather than emboldening the center, if, it, if you know what, if you see what I mean. So I think we make choices in our lives. Uh, within this freedom of speech, I think it's possible to give more voice to the voiceless. To me, that's important because you see, deep inequalities affect all of us. In a society, in a world where there are deep, deep fractures, no one can be happy. So it's actually in, our, in the benefit of everyone if we care more about equality. Maybe there will be some power shifts, but in the long run, it will be in the benefit for everyone. For instance, in a society where there's gender equality, you will see that economically, culturally, socially, and politically, everyone benefits in the long run. But in a society where half of the country is treated like slaves or inferior citizens, where women are pushed to the private space, no one will, will benefit from that in the long run. So I think it's a matter of opening up the discourse rather than pulling it into tribal divisions. I mean, what you're trying to say is also in, in the book, you sort of have very short chapters where you pick up some of the emotions that you were describing now and say, this is what we have to turn into a constructive force. And one of them is voot. It's sort of the, the anger that people fear and how to turn this into a constructive force. And that's what I often think is one of the most uh, difficult things to do now that people have gotten so polarized that it's sometimes really very difficult to pull even people back from the brink that are ideologically maybe a centimeter apart and still people can get into incredibly tough fights where they you know kick each other out of conferences and all this kind of thing so yeah. again you would and you answer this also in your book but it's sort of is it then the wisdom the knowledge that we have to bring to the table the ability to listen so that we could learn from actually what people are trying to say to us that that definitely but i also think political norms are important and political institutions are important for instance when i first moved to the uk it's been more than 12 years now i used to think british people are so calm when they talk about politics it's amazing you know when they discuss politics how come they're so calm and what happened over the years is that calmness has disappeared particularly with brexit we have seen people families, friendships being, being, you know, divided around the same dinner table, people getting emotional, angry at each other. But I think most importantly, the language of politics changed. And there was a moment when it felt like political language became full of martial metaphors, like metaphors of warfare. Suddenly opponents became enemies. 
suddenly people who think differently became enemies of the people. You will remember with Trump, for instance, one of the things that the people who rioted, um, who just barged into the, the Capitol was one of the things they wrote on the, on the door was the media is the enemy of the people. So that kind of language that immediately labels anyone who thinks differently as the enemy of the people is a very, very dangerous rhetoric. So I think whether someone is right-wing or left-wing, we need to understand that to preserve political norms, democratic institutions, shared democratic values is incredibly important and is in the benefit for everyone. We might have disagreements, but that doesn't mean you're my enemy. You know, we might disagree on so many issues. That doesn't mean this is a warfare. We need to be very careful about the language of politics. Absolutely. I think it's high time to go to questions. And I see there are a few. Yuta, what do you, can you tell us about who has what to say? Uh, there are already a lot of questions and I will just start chronically, I think. The first one is from Maximilian Amatshofer and it reads, do you think that the pan-European nation similar to the US could work out and benefit the European population, even though there are so many different languages and cultures involved? It's such an important question, I appreciate it. Well, of course, the EU itself, right, from the very beginning, um, and that's, that's what breaks my heart because, you know, I'm not a supporter of Brexit, and it, it, it was sad for me to see people discussing Brexit in terms of financial deals or trade deals, Whereas for me, it was mostly the EU was mostly about values yeah. and it was an attempt to, you know, it was an awareness that extreme nationalism, extreme militarization are so, so dangerous. That is why in the aftermath of the Second World War, after going through the horrors of the Second World War, this desire to have a union that goes beyond nationalism, beyond tribes, and brings us together under a similar umbrella, I think that was important. The values around that was important. So I'm, I'm a big believer in internationalism. And I think it is sad to see um, that spirit being lost. You know, coming back to what we said earlier, we have international challenges ahead that cannot be solved with the forces of uh, ultranationalism or, or tribalism. So for me, it's important to have international solidarity, international sisterhood, especially as a feminist. And I do believe that it's possible to think beyond nation states. But is the world of today that kind of a world? Um, no. Is that my expectation? No. I am afraid that especially with the outcome of the pandemic, with the economic repercussions of the pandemic, we are going to see a rise, a further rise in more populist nationalism. Okay, great, thank you. The next question focus on Turkey and it says, looking 10, 15 years forward, where do you see Turkey, its society and the, in the interaction of Turkey with the millions of Turks, Turkish dissidents in Europe in say 2035? Uh, this is an emotionally hard question for me because I feel torn in the sense that when I look at politics in Turkey, when I look at politicians in Turkey, I feel very depressed. You know, it is incredibly demoralizing. Um, we have this, in my opinion, worst combination, not only extremely conservative religious, but also ultra-nationalist combination, you know, in terms of the, the mixture of ideologies in power. Um, but on the other hand, when I look at the people in Turkey, so whether it's Turks, Kurds, people of different ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, Alevis, Armenians, Greeks, Jews, young people, women of Turkey, please pay attention to the women of Turkey. It's just amazing, their resilience, their bravery. So when I look at the civil society in Turkey, I always feel more optimistic. I always feel more hope. That's why my answer will change depending on where I focus. If I focus on the politics of Turkey, the next decades, again, demoralizing. If I focus on the people of Turkey, which are far ahead of their governments, in my opinion, you will, have, you will feel more, more hopeful. There are many Democrats in Turkey. There are many global souls whose voices maybe we don't hear, who maybe do not make the headlines, 
but they are there, they exist. And I think it's important that um, we do not isolate each other. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next two questions are rather on your personal opinion, I guess. The first one is, what if anything gives you hope that channels of communication can become more healthy or more open? Or do you feel we're stuck in a downward spiral of divisions and misunderstanding? And the next one says, all things considered, do you think social media is a blessing or a curse? Oh, um, I think we are at a crossroads. And it's clear to me that the old world is no more, but the new world is not built yet. So we are in the middle, you know, and this is a very, very scary time because it's full of uncertainty. It's full of complexity. And understandably, sometimes it feels like it's too much to deal with. Every day something is happening. Every day, you know, the speed of life is just too much and we can't catch up. It is a dangerous crossroads because it is precisely when populist demagogues enter into the picture and they say, just leave it to me. I'm going to make things simple for everyone. I promise you safety. I promise you sameness, you know. I'm going to simplify life. But that is a false promise. Um, so I think we are at a critical crossroads. Are we going to go in this direction, just follow false promises? Or are we going to realize that we are all interconnected as human beings? And the pandemic has shown that very clearly, that one virus originating in, let's say, one region of the world can change the lives and livelihoods of people miles and continents away. So we can erect barriers and walls in our minds, but we're not going to stop the world affecting us from affecting us. So it's healthier to have a more international vision rather than a tribal vision. But as, as I said, I think this is a crossroads and my feeling is it's going to accelerate both, both tendencies. Both the forces of populism will be accelerating also because of the economic repercussions of the pandemic, but also this awareness that we need more equality, justice, inclusion, you know, a new narrative, a new language. That awareness is also there. And also we have a new generation who is very much aware that you cannot carry on the way we have been carrying on because our, we're destroying our planet. We're destroying our own, our single and only house. So that awareness is also increasing. And there's, there's, there's lots of social movements, whether it's Me Too movement, whether it's um, young people's demands for racial equality. I, I take all of that very seriously. But all I'm trying to say is we are at a very critical crossroads. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the very insightful answer. I will now move over to the questions in the chat. There are quite a lot of. Um, the first one is, what will support us in overcoming those toxic national concepts, which are an evil heritage, heritage of colonialism and from a line to patriarch empires for more than 3,000 years? How can we live emotion without doing harm to others or evoke automatically resistance from those not sharing our opinion? Mm -hmm. You know, I think... Um, It, it never starts with yesterday, it was the, um, the Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I think it's an important day to remember that it doesn't start with gas chambers, it doesn't start with concentration camps or mass murders. The biggest atrocities in human history have always started with words, with words of hate, with the language of hate and with silences. So we need to worry about um, the language being used, how do we talk about the other? Words like vermin, parasites, as if immigrants are infesting Europe. You know, none of that rhetoric is innocent. How do we refer to people who are different to us is incredibly important to treat every human being in this world with dignity. I, as a storyteller, I also believe if I don't know someone's story, it's easier for me to make a generalization about them. But when you know someone's story, you realize actually the other, what I call the other is my brother, is my sister, you know, I am the other. It's, it's just, we have so much in common. So bringing forth the stories of the other 
in my opinion, is, is very important. If I may very quickly share this, uh, Tessa very kindly mentioned my earlier novel, my, my, my latest novel. There's a cemetery in that novel. There's an actual graveyard that I talk about. In Turkish, we call it the cemetery of the companions. And unlike any other graveyard in this place, there are no marble tombstones, there are no visitors, no flowers. There's only numbers. This is a graveyard in which actual people are turned into numbers. I became very drawn to this place years ago and I started doing research over the years. And when you do that, you realize most of the people who have been almost dumped there without a proper burial, without a proper funeral, are people who have been rejected by their families. So among them, there are lots of LGBTQ members. There are some people who committed suicide. They haven't been given proper burial. There are abundant babies who have been found on the streets and died and they're buried there. And there's a growing number of refugees. We always hear or read about in newspapers about refugees who have lost their lives as they were trying to come into Europe. Where are the bodies taken? The bodies are taken to this cemetery in Istanbul. So it's a very sad and strange place where, an, where a Syrian refugee, where an Iraqi refugee might be buried next to a Kurdish sex worker, may, might be buried next to an abundant baby, etc. And as, an, as a writer, my instinct was to try to take at least one of those numbers, people who have been turned into numbers, and try to reverse the process try to rehumanize someone who has been dehumanized. Uh, and that's why I think it all comes back to being aware of who are the people who are being dehumanized today? What can I do as an individual in order to reverse that process? So I think there is a question which, which fits very well to what you've just said, because it's also reverse directrix. And it says, don't you also think this verbal violence you talked about is a consequence of less personal contacts, like in COVID separation times, and too much communication via elect um, electronic devices or too much time shared in IT games? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I so agree that too much time shared on social media, scrolling up and down, is, is so misleading in the sense that, that it gives us the illusion that we know everything, right? When was the last time we ever said, I don't know? We forgot to say, I don't know. We can ask each other anything and everything. And if we don't know the answer, we just Google it. And in the next five minutes, we can say a few things about the subject, but that doesn't mean we know the subject. So we lost that sense of maybe the humbleness, you know, that comes with saying, I don't know, I'm still learning, I'm still thinking. We lost that. And instead, it is an age in which there are clashing certainties. Everybody is so sure, almost, of their own truth. Um, we forgot the value of doubt. We forgot the value of proper intellectual exchange. I think an intellectual exchange means I have my opinions. I thought about them and I care about my opinions, but here I am to listen to you. And if what you're saying makes sense to me, I am ready to revise my opinions. My door is not closed. So that kind of exchange is lost in today's world to a large extent. We also forgot nuanced conversations. You know, people are on a spectrum. They are not necessarily in mutually exclusive categories. That's why to go back to the basics of a proper exchange, a proper communication, and not to forget to say, I don't know from time to time, I think is very valuable. Listen, we are practically out of time now. I have to ask one question to you, Elif, where I want to hear your opinion on, there was this, uh, which I thought was actually a very, very, interesting debate about the translation of Amanda Gorman's uh, poem, The Hill We Climb. And in the German speaking world, it was quite, I thought, sad that this, this whole debate about if your background helps you in your translation of a text, was it was not taken as a chance in the German speaking world in many of the commentaries that I read. It was more that people felt 
it cannot be that only a black woman can translate a black woman, which of course also probably shouldn't be the answer uh, to this very complex question, how, what makes a translation a good translation. So I wanted to ask you what your opinion was on this rather um, divert that sort of very, very also aggressive almost debate on who should translate her poem. Uh, I, I find uh, the debate very important. If I may put it this way, when we teach creative writing or when, we, when you go to a creative writing course, one of the first things that we learn is to write what you know, right? That's the first thing that people say. And I find that very problematic because I think literature is more than that. Of course, you can write what you know, but in my opinion, literature is also the ability to write what you feel. Now, this slogan, write what you know, has been interpreted sometimes as write about who you are, which again can be quite problematic. For instance, if you're an Afghan woman writer, you are expected to write about the stories of women in Afghanistan. Nobody expects you to write sci-fi sci or avant-garde literature. Um, those roles that are attributed to writers, especially who are coming from outside the Western world, is, has, is something that I've always had trouble with. I think as writers, an Afghan woman writer might write about Afghan women, but maybe her next book is going to be about a Norwegian, you know, gay professor. Why not? Of course, when I say this, what I mean is whatever subject we write about, we have to take it, we have to approach it with a lot of respect, with a lot of care, with a lot of love. I cannot write about anything and everything as I wish, but if I put love and effort, and if I feel it in my heart, I can write about issues that are not necessarily connected to Turkey. I think writers cannot be reduced to singular identity politics. That's the beauty of literature. You know, we, we try to transcend the boundaries of the self we were born into. So coming back to your question, can a women writer write about the male experience, for instance? I think yes. And there are amazing examples of that or vice versa. Um, but to give it due, to understand the subject, to approach it with respect, to really, really put effort, to put our minds and our hearts into it. But I think it's perfectly possible for a non-Black translator to translate a Black poet, po poet's um, work if there is that kind of emotional connection, if there's that kind of care, uh, definitely, because literature is all about transcending boundaries. And I don't think it should lose that, that, that power. Excellent, thank you. Listen, there's so many questions that we still have that our listeners um, have, but we are out of time. And so I want to thank you so very much to, um, to do this talk with me. And uh, I want to again tell people about your book, which came out this month in German, Hört einander zu how to stay sane. I think we got in an in a, uh, increasingly diverse wor world. Uh, um, I think we got a good idea of your thoughts in this one hour of conversations we had now. Um, I'm always thinking how you describe in this book that uh, our accents are um, sort of the traces of the path we have already traveled and it's it's for me just beautiful to hear you speak who you, you are of course completely fluent and competent in two languages uh, english and turkish as it is i guess probably also french and whatever but this is sort of uh, just wonderful to hear also uh, your identity coming with your accent and of course my uh, schwarzenegger accent in english my german heavy german accent which is sometimes um i feel often um ashamed that I that I don't speak proper Cambridge uh, English but in a way I think you're right we are sort of a product of our history and we should probably be proud of it and not ashamed at all of it so I think we should love our accents you know I should I, I think we should love our accents 
Um, I, I cherish accents with this regional, you know, we call it broken accents, but I, I really think accents are beautiful. We should keep our accents and we should keep this conversation. I hope we can welcome you in Vienna in due course and continue this conversation. And I want to thank everyone to listen to us. I know these Zoom talks and Facebook talks are challenging to focus for an hour on a kind of virtual space. Thank you very much for everyone to come. Thank you, Kreisky, for, for hosting us. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Bye.